The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. I think most of people will think that Taiwan is already an independent country. There's no need for us to really claim ourselves as an independent country again. Of course, in order not to change the so-called status quo here or to make China angry, I don't think Taiwanese people would like to see that Taiwanese government to really declare independence officially to the world. But one question I always have is, what do we mean by status quo here? Obviously, most of the world does not recognize Taiwan as a country, even though most people around the world are very happy for Taiwan to operate as a country. I mean, you ever look at a passport from Taiwan, it just says Taiwan, Taiwan passport in English. In Chinese, it actually says Republic of China. So it's interesting that you have this way of speaking to two different languages at the same time. In this episode, the future of Taiwan is the status quo the best option. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. When Chiang Wan'an from Taiwan's opposition Guomindang, or KMT, won the Taipei mayoral election in November last year, it made headlines around the world. The reason? Speculation his victory could be a pointer to the outcome of presidential and legislative elections due early in 2024, and so influence the trajectory of Taiwan's relations with China at a delicate geopolitical moment. Chiang is purportedly the great-grandson of Chiang Kai-shek, the former leader of the Republic of China, who fled with millions of followers to the island of Taiwan in 1949 after losing the civil war on the Chinese mainland to Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party. Although the KMT had a famously adversarial relationship with the Communist Party over much of the 20th century, in the late 1990s they adopted a more conciliatory tone towards Beijing. Meanwhile, Taiwan's current ruling party, the Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, has advocated for a strong Taiwanese identity that is separate from the People's Republic of China – A stance so riling Beijing that President Xi Jinping declared in 2019 that China would not renounce the use of force to achieve reunification with the island. So, would Taiwanese efforts to pacify Beijing under a future KMT leadership really improve cross-straits relations? Is simply maintaining the one-China policy indefinitely a viable long-term strategy? What do the people of Taiwan really want – And what's the best outcome they can realistically hope for? Joining me over Zoom to pick apart the tense Taiwan-China relations making the headlines recently, a China historian, Dr Craig Smith from Asia Institute, and Taiwan watcher, Dr Lennon Chung from Monash University. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Lennon, and welcome back, Craig. Thanks, Ali. Really happy to be back. Thanks, Ali. Thanks for having me here. I want to start by looking at last year's local elections in Taiwan. Across the board, the ruling DPP did badly. It was its worst showing in 36 years, while the opposition KMT won several major races, including in the capital, Taipei, which we'll get to in a minute. Lennon, what drove the election result? And given The elections happened at a time of heightened tensions with Beijing. How much of the outcome was about China? Well, I would say um, it's important for us to really differentiate the local elections to the national elections. The local elections, based on our previous experience, then really links much to the relationship between Taiwan and China. It is more the relationship between candidates and how they connect with the local people. So it's hard for us to really translate the result of the local election as a predictor to what will happen in 2024. So, Craig, if I can bring you in here, what does drive people's vote in regional polls? Well, I mean, a lot of the same things that drive them for the national polls. So I think that what we're seeing here is 
Well, in many ways, it's what often happens in a two-party system or a system that's really dominated by two parties. It's a regular cycle. But also, we have some really interesting historical things coming in here. And also, there's always the omnipresence of China and the economy. So a lot of different things are happening in the last few years to drive these election results. And in local elections, Craig, the KMT traditionally does better, doesn't it? Well, yes, but this election, they've done much better. And uh, there are some surprising results because in some of the urban areas that the DPP have done much better in recent years, the KMT have actually won mayoral seats. Well, let's look at one of those successes, which is, uh, as we mentioned in the introduction in Taipei, where the race for mayor was won by Chiang Wan'an for the KMT. Lenin, can you tell us a bit about him and, and who he is? Chiang Wan'an is a candidate of KMT and he got selected. One of the main reasons is that he is the grand-grandson of Chiang Kai-shek and the grandson of Chiang Jingguo. And um, he, as a figure or the prince figure of KMT, he has been chosen as the candidate for the Taipei mayor election. He is also seen as a figure to unite the KMT. And so how significant is his victory? Taipei is always a city that mayor rotates most of the times. For example, we have KMT in the past holding the mayor seat, and then we have Chen Shui-bian taking up the seat, and then we have Ke Wen-te taking up the seat. So it's not a stable seat for specific party. Instead, it's more based on the prevalence of uh, people in Taipei during that period of time. But Lenin, on what basis was Chiang Wan'an elected? Is it his economic policies, his health policies? What were the issues that made that mayoral race go to the KMT this time? Personally, I don't see much of the policy coming out from Chiang Wan'an this time. I think it's more his charisma that wins the votes. Do you agree, Craig? Well, in some ways, yes, I agree. But I think that Jiang Wan An, I mean, it's the name. We all know that. That was an important part of this election. But it's also that he's a good looking man. He has good connections to the US. You know, he, he was a lawyer in the US. So if you want to be positive about him, there's a lot of good things about him in one package. He's very young, but he comes in with this. American experience that is quite easy to sell in Taiwan. On the other hand, if you want to be negative about it, you could say, well, he he was a lawyer in a small firm in a small town. He didn't really succeed in America, and that's why he came back. So I think there's lots of things that people love about him. But for those probably older, very pro-KMT voters, I think that really a big part of it is who his father was, who his grandfather was, and who his great-grandfather was. And for me, that's what's really amazing about this election. You know, the Taipei election is the big one in these local elections. And this connection to history, this surprising continuity of a legacy that we were starting to think was broken is really amazing. The KMT still have a very strong connections and networks in Taipei, especially in specific areas such as um, Wunshan area. Based on those networks or connections that Jiang Wanan and KMT have, I might take different view to what Craig says. It's not a surprise to me. It's more that most of the KMT people come out to vote, while the people who are usually more supporting DPP didn't really come out and cast their vote this time. I want to go back to the legacy of the Chiang name, but do you see, Craig, that the issues this time, you know, you've both made the point that they were local, they were regional elections, that they don't relate so much to China. Does that mean that it is more about things like economic issues, business issues, financial cost of living issues, as it is in every other country at the moment, health issues in a semi-post-pandemic world? Well, yes, I think that economic issues and health issues are currently really the important things that are swaying people. And maybe that these are some of the issues that sway people more towards the Kuomintang and away from the DPP. But it's still related to China. I mean, economic issues in Taiwan are always related to China. It's inevitable. 
42% of the exports that uh, Taiwan ships around the world every year go to China, which isn't really a high number because Australia is not much below that. But in Taiwan, exports are such a more important part of the economy that you can't ignore them. And yes, health is a big issue in the pandemic. And it's really important to point out who Jiang was running against. Chen Shizhong was responsible for public health over the last few years. So he was the face of the battle against the pandemic. He was the one that everybody saw when they got up in the morning and turned on the TV to see how many cases or how many deaths there were last night. So he's a representative of that battle against the pandemic. Craig just made the point that everything is connected in one way or another to China, which brings us, if we just step back a bit and have a look at the two main political parties that we've been talking about, Lennon, is it fair to say that the KMT and the DPP, that Taiwan's relations with China would be the main political divide between those two parties today? When we compare the KMTs with the DPPs, we'll always think um, green and blue. For those who are more voting for the Greens are those who are more tend to be voting for Taiwan dependence and, and localization. That's DPP, isn't it? Green That's is DPP. DPP, blue is KMT. And the blue for KMT are usually the group of people who are, who are more inclined for unification, are more hoping to build up a better connections with China or even leads to a one China in the future. So if we're talking about this, yes, the main divide between KMT and DPP at the moment is more their attitude towards unification or pro-independence. Do you think, Craig, that given this was the worst showing for the DPP in 36 years, I mean, that's not a comfort to the DPP, I imagine, going into the presidential elections. Do you think that you can infer something about how people are feeling on the bigger issues of the China relationship? Uh, well, definitely these big issues do come up at an election time. So a lot of people are talking about it and a lot of people have made complaints, especially about the economy. And when the economy is bad, it means Taiwan's relationship with China is problematic. So it's quite easy for the KMT to play that role and say, look, we want to have a better economy. We want to build better relations with China. So definitely it's still an important part of things. I mean, you can see the difference in the economy around the island and you hear people talk about it all the time. So I think economic matters are still one of the deciding factors for voters today. And will they be in 2024? Well, it depends what you mean, because, you know, economic matters are China matters. So will people want to vote for the KMT because they think the KMT is a better choice for the future of the economy? Or will they vote because they're more inclined towards Taiwanese independence and uh, taking a firm stance against China? We can divide it like that. But in reality, the parties are both playing the middle really well right now. And Jiang Wan An is one of those figures who knows how to play the middle. And I mean, obviously, this is something that happens in every democracy around the world. If you're smart, you know how to play the middle and get the votes. And I think we are seeing a little bit of that already. And we're going to see a lot more of that in the next election. What we can see here at, at the moment, Taiwan is doing pretty well in terms of economy and, and health, but still people vote for KMT. There's something interesting here. It's not only about whether people think their life is good or not. It's, I believe there are some elements that attract people to vote for KMT, not just the economy bit. I think the economy is doing well in some respects, but we're seeing a lot of people at the bottom are not seeing that come through. So I've been in Taiwan for most of the last year, and I've done a lot of traveling. And things are very different when you travel around these days because of the pandemic, but also because there are no more Chinese tourists. And that's one thing that people said to me a lot is that the current government is responsible for getting rid of all those tourist dollars. Now, the pandemic is obviously a big part of this as well, undeniably. But the way that people are seeing it, I mean, and, you know, people are doing this all over the world. They're 
blaming the current government for the issues related to the pandemic. I mean, I'm not saying that Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP are not responsible for losing Chinese tourist dollars. There is some connection there, but I would say that people are blaming the DPP for it. Again, if we go back to the parties, because it can be confusing for people outside Taiwan to understand how did the KMT evolve from being the adversary of China's Communist Party, as we've said, and we know that under Chiang Kai-shek, they moved to Taiwan after losing the civil war on the Chinese mainland, to now being the party, Lenin, that is the one advocating closer ties with Beijing. How did that shift happen? Oh, I think one of the core ideas that KMT have is to have a unified China. They always think they are the one who will represent China in that sense. So during the time when they withdrew from China in 1949, as they just see the CCP, the Communist Party, as their enemy. But those generations have slowly passed away and the new generation starting to build up more connections with China, especially when we've seen the past um, 20, 30 years, a lot of businessmen were doing their business, set up their uh, industry or companies in China. With this new type of ties, some Taiwanese people, especially businessmen, are um, getting more close to China and try to have a better relationship with CCP. So I think it is back to what Craig was arguing, the economy is a main driven force that makes KMT, the Kuomintang, to change their attitude from totally against CCP to now they're sort of thinking we should work together with CCP in order to maintain their power in Taiwan. And Craig, if the KMT is in support of reunification, it doesn't mean, does it, uh, one China under the Communist Party? Yeah, it definitely does not mean one China under the Communist Party. So reunification can mean a lot of different things. And I think for most people, it's best to see it as an ideal rather than something that's going to happen in the next few years. Officially, the Guomindan support the 1992 consensus, which is the idea that there is one China. So the one China principle and the principle of reunification. But it can be reinterpreted in a lot of different ways. So nobody said one China under the Communist Party. And of course, nobody said one China under the KMT. So these days, the younger generation in the KMT tend to avoid directly discussing reunification, even though it is for the older generation, it is really one of the driving principles behind the party. Just an add up of what um, Craig just mentioned about the 1992 consensus here. The consensus was um, that both sides agree there's only one China, but how to define China, it's um, the interpretation lays in either side. So Chinese government the CCP has their own interpretation of what one China means, and Taiwan can have its own interpretation. But this has been changed since Xi Jinping has taken over the power. They start to say one China is the PRC. You know, there's no way of other interpretation here. So this kind of 1992 consensus uh, in some ways has been changed, or the, the concept or the nature of it has been changed totally since it was established. Craig, you said when we were talking about the mayoral race for Taipei, what you found most extraordinary about it was the the historical part of it and the, the name, Chiang Wan'a, and the successful candidate who is uh, the great-grandson purportedly of Chiang Kai-shek. How is Chiang Kai-shek viewed today and his legacy? And talk about the white terror decades and the whole process of trying to you know, make peace from those times. Okay, yeah. So um, the Kuomintang was the party that ruled the Republic of China, right? So this started 1912. They've been um, almost a one-party state from that time until recent decades. And at the end of World War II, of course, Taiwan was part of the Japanese Empire. But with the San Francisco Treaty, the transfer of Taiwan to the Republic of China began. And this means to the Kuomintang, right? So as you know, The KMT lost the civil war with the Communist Party only four years later. That's 1949. But before that even happened, things were falling apart in Taiwan. Uh, The KMT was fighting a really intense war on the mainland. So they're sending resources to the front 
And that includes all the rice that people are eating, all the metal that they need to cook their food. It was getting quite severe. So in 1947, the height of the war, the local people start taking control of much of the island through a series of uprisings that, that we now call the 228 incident. So things were really bad. People were thinking, hey, it was better during the Japanese imperial time. This is not good at all. Chiang Kai-shek, of course, on the mainland, he doesn't like seeing uh, Taiwanese territory being taken over by the locals. So he orders part of the army to go to Taiwan. I mean, most of the army is over in the mainland and even the police force, a lot of the police force was over in the mainland fighting the civil war. So he sends boats back and the story goes they were shooting before they even touched the shore. There were massacres. Then martial law was put in place for 40 years. So from 1947 until the 1980s, the situation in Taiwan was pretty bad. As most people refer to it as the white terror because sympathizers to leftist politics were thrown in prison or executed. So they, they bore the word white terror from Russian history. So this is kind of a lot of what is remembered by the, the Taiwanese people. I mean, people not born in mainland China. This is the way a lot of people remember Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang. But of course, it's a long time ago. So history has changed. And we really see a different view on Chiang Kai-shek today that's very confrontational and is still marked by the difference between the two parties. So in 2018, the Tsai Ing-wen government established a transitional justice commission, the TJC. And this is kind of like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa and in many other countries. And they were investigating injustices during the white terror. So one part of what they do is they work on historical memory. And that means changing a lot of the names that were related to authoritarian rule. It also meant getting rid of statues. And in the 1990s, Chiang Kai-shek's face was everywhere. I mean, there was a statue in front of every school. And now he's gone. You don't see him on the streets. You don't see him anywhere except in the memorial hall. And last year, the TJC suggested getting rid of Chiang Kai-shek's statue from the Memorial Hall, although that brought a lot of anger and brought a lot of controversy. So we see that probably most people think of Chiang Kai-shek as an authoritarian ruler these days. But there are some, especially within the KMT, that look back at Chiang Kai-shek as the founder of the nation. So how does that measure, though, against the success of his great-grandson in the Taipei mayoral race? Um, for me, this is so fascinating just because Jiang Wan An has actually managed to have his cake and eat it too. So, yes, many people refer to him as being the great-grandson of Chiang Kai-shek. But he didn't even know that himself until he was, I think he was in about high school, when his father, Jiang Xiaoyan, told him about this relationship. And at the time, the family name changed to Jiang. So to follow Chiang Kai-shek in Mandarin, the Chiang Kai-shek surname is Jiang. So um, the family all took on this surname to create the Chiang Kai-shek family legacy. But... Of course, since that time, in the last 20 years, the name Chiang Kai-shek has not been as well received in Taiwan. So how do you get elected when so many people look down upon your great-grandfather? Well, what Jiang Wan'an has done is basically he's ignored this legacy. And so by not talking about it, and kind of distancing himself from it, he's able to get all those voters that think that he's the great grandson of Chiang Kai-shek and want to vote for him for those reasons. But also the people who are a little bit more ambivalent or not sure, they're able to say, well, it's not really a legacy. I'm voting for him because he's a good, young, intelligent leader in the KMT. 
That is indeed having your cake and eating it too. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by Dr Lennon Chung, President of the Australasian Taiwan Studies Association and Dr Craig Smith from Asia Institute. We're discussing the relationship between Taiwan and China. And more broadly... We should go back to the big picture of the relationship between Taipei and Beijing. And Lenin, why is it that they are so fraught right now? Of course, people will say it's because DPP is in power. They don't really want to build up good connections with China. But my view to that is it is not that DPP doesn't want to have good connections with China. It's more how they maintain their ideology at the same time that they have more pro-independence and also keep a good relationship with China. And from CCP's perspective, of course, they don't want this to, to happen. So while DPP is in power, they tend to cut back the connections with Taiwan and try to use different ways to, as an incentive or a threat to Taiwanese government, Taiwanese people, saying that if you're inclined for pro-independence, we're going to cut back all the ties with you, and uh, you will all suffer from the economic decrease as well as the international relationship all over the world. And we did see that, didn't we, Lenin, with the visit of the US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taipei? Yeah, we see a lot of... uh, cyber attacks during Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, as well as um, disinformation campaigns, as well as we see China use some economic sanction to Taiwan as a way to scare Taiwanese people not to accept Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. So, Craig, how has Taiwan responded to China's intimidation? Actually, can I I return to the last question first? Yes, of course. Because there's a few things I'd like to add to what Lenin said, because... For me, there's another interesting element to all this is what's going on in China and why is China raising all this anger at this time? Why are they sending all these planes over? For me, when anything bad is going on like this, I always look at what's going on in China because China is not a totalitarian country. It's an authoritarian country. And they really rely upon support from the population. So driving patriotism is always one of the most important goals for the Communist Party. And we see that they do sometimes react to what the people are thinking, just as when there were protests against the lockdowns across China at the end of 2022, the government did respond. Now, when things are really bad in China, they tend to turn towards Japan, turn towards Taiwan and find issues and make people riled up and get people excited about an external threat or an external problem. And this is just smart politics, to be honest. So while things have been going bad in China over the last six months or a year, as the pandemic's been getting worse and worse, and they've been having quite serious economic issues everywhere in China, right now is a really good time to try and divert attention towards the issues in Taiwan. So while I agree with Lenin that a lot of this is related to Taiwanese politics, I think things are getting more intense and things are getting uh, a little bit more dangerous, partly because of what's happening domestically in China. I agree with Craig in this part. I always think that if China is going to launch a war against Taiwan, one of the main reasons will definitely be that the power within CTP is not stable and they try to divert this unstable power to unite people within China using the way that Taiwan is going to be separated and we should be all together and care about the unity of our country rather than doing all those domestic politics. As you've both gone to the issue of whether or not this will escalate, let me go there next as well. I mean, how likely is a conflict from where we stand at the moment? And I appreciate what what you're saying about what's happening internally in China as well. But taking that into account, do you agree with people like the former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, who is now Australia's ambassador to the US, who says that Xi Jinping was putting his country on a war footing and would be in a position to take action against Taiwan in the late 2020s or in the 2030s. And there have been many others who have also forecast an escalation in the situation. Lenin, do you think it is likely or less likely? 
Well, I won't say the war will never happen. That's always a chance that there might be a war. But for someone who grew up in Taiwan, we've been under this threat for more than 50, 60 years. Every day we've been talking about the possibility that China will launch a war or we will be under the war with China. But in the past few years, we see more and more this kind of discussion within the Western society. I think one of the reasons is we see more Western medias um, paying attention to the Taiwan-China relationship, and as well as there are more journalists uh, now located in Taiwan and try to report the situation in Taiwan. But whether the war will happen in the coming months or years, my stand will be, I don't think it's going to happen unless A, Taiwan declare independence formally, or B, that's an internal conflict, a serious internal conflict within CCP that has threatened the power or the status of Xi Jinping. We use this as a way to sort of calm down the internal politics issues and to make his power stable. I'm completely in agreement with Lenin that a war is unlikely, but definitely possible. I've been in Taiwan off and on since the mid 90s. And every time I go to Taiwan, somebody says to me, aren't you worried that China is going to attack? No, I'm not worried. Yeah, sometimes uh, they rattle the sabers. Many times they fired missiles over the island. And recently, the airplanes have been crossing the lines and um, trying to make people a little bit more worried. But I still see that as an important part of politics. I do not think that either side is interested in going to a war. I mean, a war would be bad for everybody. I don't think the Chinese government is stupid. In fact, I think there are a lot of very intelligent people running that government. And they know that although they have perhaps one of the strongest militaries in the world, And they could certainly destroy the Taiwanese army. I'm sure they could. That doesn't mean they could occupy Taiwan. Occupations are very difficult. They consume a lot of time and money. And really, they're only possible in the really, really long term. So I don't think anybody in China sees the occupation of Taiwan as a smart move at this time. And for Taiwan, of course, people in Taiwan do not want a war. So I don't think a war is going to happen. I hope a war isn't going to happen. If a war does happen, it's going to be because of some stupid accident. And Lenin said that if the Taiwanese government declares independence, yeah, but the Taiwanese government is probably not going to declare independence. So I think the only way I could see things going towards war is if somebody makes a really big mistake. I think we can probably see that for what Xi Jinping is doing in the past few years, he wants to have a good reputation on the history book. Having Taiwan back to the so-called motherland by the CCP is definitely a good note to be marked down in the history book. But if this kind of reunion caused a lot of death or a huge damage towards the economy of both Taiwan and China, I don't think that's something he would like to see. Because, of course, what we haven't talked about is the role of the US. And they would seem to me to be a very key third player in the China-Taiwan relationship. I mean, the US, of course, has got a one-China policy. It's got the Taiwan Relations Act, which governs its relationships with Taiwan. It's also got the National Defence Authorization Act. Uh, Craig, historically, what's been the goal of US policy towards Taiwan? And why is it so important to America today? Well, if you look over the long run, the U.S. supported Taiwan even before it was Taiwan. So they supported the KMT and they supported the Republic of China. In the 1950s, everybody called Taiwan Free China, right, as opposed to Red China. And at at that time, America was trying to sell itself as the leader of the free. I guess in some ways it still is. So For a lot of, especially older Americans, Taiwan has taken on an important symbolism in that respect that, I mean, this is Cold War rhetoric, right? But really, Taiwan is kind of like the last front. It's fighting against Red China. 
Now, that kind of talk probably doesn't sell as well today, but in America now, although the arguments against China are no longer about communism, there's still a lot of fear of China. There's a lot of talk about China and Taiwan is seen as standing up to China. So Taiwan has managed to maintain its symbolic importance in American politics up to this point. And I would imagine it will be able to continue to do so. Is there any question in your mind, Craig, that the US would come to Taiwan's defence if China did move? Well, if if something happened today, and as I said, I don't think anything is going to happen But if something did, yeah, I would imagine that the U.S. would stand up. But the U.S. is a really complicated country. And if we look at American politics over the last 10 or 20 years, you know, things change really quickly. So a different government might be very important. Also, the U.S. is often involved in other wars around the world. And there is always the possibility that the U.S. will not be in a good position to help in such a war. I'm talking not at the moment, but perhaps in 10 years from now, who knows? So if things did get bad in relations between Taiwan and the U.S., or if the U.S. was not in a position to help, then China might be more willing to invade. Like I said, I think they're very intelligent people and they would... uh, watch for a good opportunity. Then, and what what do you think? And of course, there's also a business perspective on this, isn't there, with the, you know, the significance of the semiconductor industry in Taiwan to global supply chains, which can't be uh, completely discounted as part of the relationship, particularly with the US. I think one of the key things why Taiwan has been drawing more international attention and people of Western countries is because there are a lot of connections between Taiwan and the world. And definitely the TSMC, the semiconductor industry is one of them, as Taiwan has all the skills that other countries doesn't have. And a lot of industry need that skill or device or chips in order to build up their technology and future society. So this actually gives Taiwan a very good protection in the sense that U.S. Japan didn't want to see China taking over Taiwan and taking control of all those critical infrastructure industries that allows them to become the leading countries in the world and have Japan or U.S. caught all into them as China for the chips. What about how Taiwan has responded to all of this? Uh, I mean, particularly there is the the intimidation from China, but also the seeking to isolate them geopolitically. Lenin, can you give us an idea of some of the things that Taiwan has done? I mean, that they've they're increasing uh, the time people are conscripted uh, starting next year, aren't they? Well, um, one of the key things that you will be able to see is the southbound policy. We try to divert the investment in China to the Southeast Asia so that we won't rely that heavily on the China economy and as well as being held by Chinese government, CCP government in uh, Taiwan economy. But we also see that Taiwanese government is trying to use its soft power, including the TSMC semiconductor industry, to build up better connections with the Western countries. And this kind of connections will tie up the, the fate of Taiwan with other Western countries. So that give Taiwan a protection to make it difficult for China to invade Taiwan. Um, other things which we see, the increasing of defense budget, as well as the increasing of the service terms of the military service to all the adult male in Taiwan is also a way that Taiwanese government is doing to build up the capacity and ability to fight against China if needed. Apart from what Taiwanese government is doing, we also see that NGOs, private sectors, or even civil society organizations are training to to the local uh, general public to build up a sense of war and what they need to do or they need to prepare during the wartime. So we see these kind of things are coming up, especially in the past year or two, and that actually draw very good attention to the Taiwanese people and the world. 
a lot of people are definitely commenting on it is not a wise move for DPP to increase the military service term. We see, we see some statistics or some surveys actually tell us that for the young generations, they are happy to take this up to fight for their own country. But most of the parents, of course, they don't want to see this to happen as they want to see their kids having a successful career in the future. And this kind of extension of the service in the military will have impact towards their career paths in the future. Which does bring us nicely to the role of the Taiwanese people and how they view their relationship with China. If I can ask you first, Craig, how do most Taiwanese view the relationship with China and indeed their own identity? That's a really complicated question because Taiwan is a very divided society. So millions of people came over in the late 1940s and early 1950s from mainland China. So that completely changed the population, which means that Taiwanese people today still have a lot of family in China. And yeah, that's that's changing because as time goes on, those links are more and more removed. But still, they are important that people do have connections to China. There are also a lot of Taiwanese people in China, perhaps less after the pandemic, but before the pandemic, like Shanghai had a million Taiwanese. That's absolutely amazing. So those connections are very important. So there are a lot of real connections that still continue to this day. Never mind all the um, the business connections, right? Foxconn is uh, one of Taiwan's most important companies and they make all the phones for Samsung and Apple and even for Sony in China, but it's a Taiwanese company operating in China. So a lot of Taiwanese people have strong connections to China. That doesn't mean that they consider themselves Chinese. In fact, it can even work the opposite way. I found when I lived in Shanghai and talked to Taiwanese people, they became more cognizant of their Taiwanese identity when they were in China. So trying to answer your question, a lot of Taiwanese people consider themselves Taiwanese. Some Taiwanese people do consider themselves to be Chinese. For many people, there is an overlap between those identities. And now even the Taiwanese independence movement has kind of fractured and you have part of the independence movement looks at having, I guess it's kind of like a Chinese independence movement. So they want to have an independent Republic of China. So things are very complicated in terms of Taiwanese identity. It's quite difficult to pin down. Lennon, do you agree? I do agree with Craig's point of view. Just to give some statistics here, according to the survey down in Taiwan, no matter which organization do it, we see that more than half of the population in Taiwan think themselves as Taiwanese. And those who think they are both Taiwanese and Chinese are on the decrease. I got a statistic here in front of me. We see from 2000 to 2022, the identity recognition of Taiwanese has increased from around 40 to 60 in 2022. So there's a, a huge increase there. And those who think themselves as a Chinese only has decreased significantly from 12% to less than 4% at the moment. So we see a lot of uh, Taiwanese now think themselves as a Taiwanese rather than a Chinese. And of course, this might relate it to what we call the natural independence. For those kids who grew up under the democratic Taiwan, they'll probably be more inclined to see Taiwan as a country, a separate country to China. And some people claim this is because of the education, they're sort of brainwashed. But I would say it's the way Taiwanese people now live in Taiwan. If you tell them they are going to lose their freedom of speech, freedom of publication, so they have to be back to the communist society, but we will see an increase of those people who claim themselves as Taiwanese in this scenario. Yeah, if I can jump in, you know, Lenin, the thing we never really talked about, but is related to all these issues that you just raised is Hong Kong. I think that if we hadn't seen the events in Hong Kong in the last five years, things might be a little bit different. So the collapse of the one country, two systems model and this horrible crisis of identity 
that many Hong Kongese are going through and is very, very vocal, very obvious in the media here. There are a lot of Hong Kongese now living in Taiwan. I think things really changed in that respect. And Xi Jinping actually in 2019 and in 2021, he wrote a letter, an open letter saying that Taiwan and the Taiwanese government should enter into a one country, two systems approach. And it just seems so out of touch looking at what's going on in Hong Kong and looking at the Taiwanese response to it. I feel like a lot of the interest in a Taiwanese identity is actually in relation to what's happened in Hong Kong in the last few years. So, Lennon, does that mean that most Taiwanese actively want independence now? Does it mean they're happy or happiest with the status quo? What does it mean for what people want for Taiwan? Well, this is a very interesting question. Do they want independence? I think most of people will think that Taiwan is already an independent country. There's no need for us to really claim ourselves as an independent country again. And of course, in order not to change the so-called status quo here or to make China angry and uh, raise potential wars, I don't think Taiwanese people would like to see that Taiwanese government to really declare independence officially to the world. But when I'm talking about status quo, one question I always have is, what do we mean by status quo here? When we're talking about status quo, a lot of people are saying that uh, we remain the current situation, Taiwan and China just maintain good relationship, don't need to do anything to change the current situation. But this has already been changed since 1949 to the time when Chen Shui-bian get in power now. When we say status quo now, it's more Taiwan as an independent country, China is an independent country, they don't belong to each other. It's totally different to the old days that TNT is still the ruling power of China or PRC or what Chinese government is claiming that PRC is the legal authority to represent China in the world. I think we need to look back and really think about what status quo here means before we really talk about whether we should remain the status quo. Craig, do you agree with that? And would it be very different if there was a change of government in 2024 away from the DPP towards the KMT? Uh, well, I agree with what Lenin said about Taiwanese effectively seeing their country as independent in all respects. It has been a country for a long time. And I think the issue is not about is it a country? It's about who recognizes it as a country. And uh, obviously, most of the world does not recognize Taiwan as a country, even though most people around the world are very happy for Taiwan to operate as a country. I mean, you ever look at a passport from Taiwan? It just says Taiwan, Taiwan passport in English. In Chinese, it actually says Republic of China. So it's interesting that you have this uh, way of speaking to two different uh Two different languages at the same time, but uh, certainly a passport from Taiwan is just a Taiwanese passport. Your second question was, will things change if we see a KMT government come into power in 2024? In terms of the status quo, I think very little will change because there's not much room for things to change. If the KMT does get into power in 2024, it's because they played that middle ground really well in which they got those voters who are not fervently pro-independence, but maybe still pro-Taiwan. I mean, there are, I suppose there are a number of reasons that the KMT could come into power, but the KMT certainly would not be looking to just start talking about reunification with China. So I can't imagine the status quo not continuing. It is a fascinating conversation. And as you said, Lennon, I mean, there's always questions of what we're talking about when we talk about the status quo. And I'm guessing that that's a, a conversation that we can continue to have into the future. An enormous thank you to both of you for being so very generous with your time and your insights. Thank you for joining you to Asia. Thanks very much, Ali. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, everyone. 
Our guests have been Dr. Craig Smith from Asia Institute and Dr. Lennon Chung from Monash University. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show and put a good word in for us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 17th of January, 2023. Producers were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.